Welcome to It's Me Again, the official podcast of the Sports Media Entertainment GBTA Committee. My name is Amy Thiessen. And I'm Greg Bell. We're your hosts on this podcast series, which will explore the behind the scenes, backstage, and locker room views of how business travel revolves around these very unique industries. We'll explore travel trends, use cases, and rules of engagement of the sports media and entertainment world, and each episode will feature special guests who are experts in their field to help us unpack and demystify each industry. In this ever-changing travel climate, our goal is to leave you with up-to-the-date insights and relevant, actionable guidance. So without further ado, let's play ball and action. We're on the air in five, four, three, two. two. On our last episode, we chatted with travel manager Francine Summers and Hall of Fame broadcaster Tom Hamilton from my hometown boys, the Cleveland Indians, now the Cleveland Guardians, about the return to baseball travel and learned about the importance of relationships and how the little things like a hotel serving cheeseburgers to a hungry baseball club at two in the morning are what counts. It's a really fun episode with some great advice for the travel industry. And if you haven't listened to it, we highly recommend it. This episode, we're shifting to another industry that was an early adopter in the return to travel after the lockdowns, film and TV, uh, which happens to be your old stomping ground, huh, Amy? Yes, it is. And I'm totally thrilled to be taking a journey back to this previous world of television production. And if it's anything like what I remember, we are going to hear some great and maybe crazy stories today. Uh, Film and television production is absolutely no joke. And there are so many moving pieces that are constantly changing. And you're absolutely correct, Greg, about the production being an early adopter in the return to travel, um, kind of as a result of the lockdown, because everyone was watching everything on TV, because what else were we going to do? We could go for a neighborhood walk or we could watch TV. So I personally binged a couple shows. One of them was Outlander. And we're lucky enough to be talking to the people who worked on that show, Pamela Aberg and Steve Kent from Sony Pictures. Welcome to the show. Welcome, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for, yeah, yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. We are very honored to have both of you here. I'll start off with just a formal introduction of Steve. Steve Kent is on our show today. He is currently the Senior Executive President for Sony Pictures. He travels a great deal and oversees international productions such as Outlander in Scotland and Fantasy Island in Puerto Rico, just to name a few. He is originally from Pound Ridge, New York, and earned a bachelor's degree in film and television and an MBA from Syracuse. And when he graduated, Steve moved to L.A. with no job and knew no one. We may have to ask about that later. (laughs) Stories in there. (laughs) And he landed his first job at CBS in the HR department, but he didn't stop there. He joined Sony Pictures in 1995 and never left. Early in his career, he served as vice president in production for then what was known as Columbia's TriStar Television, working on a series, uh, Dawson's Creek, and also Early Edition. Before joining Sony Pictures Television, he spent nine years as supervising producer for the popular soap opera Santa Barbara, and that garnered him three Emmy Awards for his work. Congrats, Steve. Thank you. And also, I hear that Steve is maybe involved in acquiring the worldwide rights to Shark Tank. Is is there a story behind this, Steve? There, there, there is a story, to it. You gave the punchline. Um, oh, but, no. Um, <laughs> Should we but, start over? <laughs> uh, well, the, the story is that um, every year there is a, a festival in Cannes, not the Cannes Film Festival, but for television, which is called MIPCOM. There's MIPCOM is in the spring and MIP TV is in the fall or the other way around. Um, they're, they're the same festival where um, producers bring their shows for buyers to look at. Um, so Sony, of course, is there, Sony Pictures, um, with all of the shows that we make where they try to sell them to various countries, you know, Europe and Asia and whatever, all the different networks. And, and so I was... Uh, at, at one point in charge of local language production around the world, which is we would make shows in whatever the language of the country <clears throat> that we were in. So in Russia, we made Russian shows and in Germany, German shows. And um, um, 
it was actually kind of interesting. We had <clears throat> the number one comedy in Germany on RTL, and it was written in Sherman Oaks by <laughs> two American writers that went to Germany where it would be localized. And it was called Nurse Nicola. It was about this obnoxious doctor in a hospital. It was, it was funny. And um, it was a big hit written in <laughs> California, which I, I always got a kick out of that. Um, but um, anyway, back to this, this festival in Cannes. So we would, I, I would go around and look and see what other production companies are doing. And I went down into the basement, which is where the smallest production companies would have their booths. And there was a show from Japan in Japanese that had five guys and it had the production values of a high school, you know, production. Five guys looked like they were sitting in a cafeteria um, with a stack of yen in front of them. And the host was, and it was translated for me, but was going, you know, uh, thank you, gentlemen, the sharks, uh, dra dragons, they call them dragons, um, for coming. And um, people would pitch their idea and try to get the dragons to give them money. And I thought to myself, this is a great idea that'll work everywhere. Because in every country, there is somebody who goes, oh, I've just got a great idea. If only I could get some backing behind it. So we, I said, let's get the worldwide rights to this show called Dragon's Den. And we did. And we launched it in the UK. And we launched it in Canada. And we launched it in a bunch of other places. Could not sell it in the United States. We took it to CNBC. They sniffed. We don't. We're a business network we don't do game shows meanwhile the show was like run constantly now on cnbc the repeat and um then mark burnett um who you know you know who he is um t was taking a look at our formats that we have in our library we have the formats to the newlywed game and the dating game and gong show and a bunch of shows and dragon's den got his interest um so he goes let's take dragon's den we'll call it shark tank and we'll put fish in a aquarium and we'll call the the guys sharks and that's what the history of shark tank is started off me seeing the japanese show in the basement of the palais in camp so there you go. <laughs> oh my god that's amazing that is amazing. <laughs> what an amazing story i had no idea <laughs> So probably more than you wanted to know about Shark Tank, but anyway, there you go. Um, no, it, it's it's shocking that the U.S. didn't pick it up. It seems very U.S. Like I feel like the U.S. would love something like that, or we do now. But you, you know, now, yeah, but no, couldn't couldn't get anybody interested in. And the Japanese were like, oh, I thought you guys were going to sell it to um, you know the American Television Network, and yeah. they kept calling me. And I'd go, oh, no, it's looking really, really good. We had a great meeting. And I'd look over to my colleague and he'd go, we got nothing. We got nothing. <laughs> day now, any day now, we'll have it sold. Um, so. The sharks were out when you pitched that. Yeah, I, I got to say that it's one of my favorite shows. And I have so, okay. many, I have yeah. so many ideas, Steve. So we'll, we'll talk offline about it. <laughs> well, I think it says something. It says something about the um, not even cultural sensitivity as much as needing to kind of change something a little bit for your audience, you know. And like you said, you went from Dragon's Den to calling it Shark Tank, and there was something about it that made people attracted. So I think that's that's uh, says a lot about well, magic too and the creativity. And and it, it's so that's an interesting point. You know, it, it appeals to the universal instinct and and i found this making shows all around the world were more alike than different so that's why i knew that dragon's den would work because everywhere people have ideas and they need them to get backed um so, anyway. right we all need funding like that's that's yeah. just business right that's yeah. at every every business where it starts from so oh super so, cool and, and so you know just i i've seen this just I, I've traveled an incredible amount. I've been really lucky. I have, I have 11 million advantage miles. <laughs> <laughs>
which is I read that wrong. That I did too. not. That I, is like <laughs> I think I read that wrong. Is it eleven million? Eleven million. Oh my god! And, uh, All right, that's impressive. You know, um, like, the first time I ever traveled anywhere was I was a sophomore, um, and my mom talked to some old friends of our family who were transferred to Tokyo with IBM. So I went over to Tokyo, and I got there, and they were like. They had no interest in taking me around or anything. They handed me a map and I was on my own walking around Tokyo and I'm quite tall. So I was like a foot taller than everybody else. And I went all around Japan by myself. And and the first, when I was there, it was um, somebody told me you can eat in department stores in the basement because I had no money either. So I went to the basement of Takashimaya department store And I'm like, you know, my head's spinning because everything's in Japanese everywhere. And I go up to the counter and the woman says, hi. And in Japanese, hi means yes. So I go, hi. (laughs) Oh, hi, you speak English. This is so good. You don't know what a a part of this maneuver. (laughs) And she's like, blank. blank. that, That got me. That was my first miles of my 11 million. <laughs> uh, this is incredible. Uh, Amy, we struck gold here. Uh, 11 million miles. I mean, on a, on a travel podcast, this is pretty incredible. <laughs> Pamela, welcome to the show, Pam. Pamela Aberg is a native of Los Angeles, North Hollywood. Uh, and Pam's been working in the travel industry since the tender age of 15 as a part-time job after school. She started working for Sony Pictures Travel in 1990 as a corporate travel agent around the same time that Sony had purchased Columbia and TriStar Pictures. Her work experience at SPE Travel has covered virtually all facets of travel, from corporate, production, to publicity. Pamela now co-directs SPE Travel and has been instrumental in the growth and development of SPE's rare and highly effective in-house travel program. A fun travel fact about Pamela is that by the time she was 21, her passport was full as she had spent time traveling down the Amazon in a small paddle boat, fishing for piranha using (laughs) steak on a hook. (laughs) Pam, we have to unpack this a little bit. (laughs) I know. I I don't have a picture to prove it. I just have to find it. (laughs) Oh my God. So this is a travel podcast and we'll get to that, but like, let's talk about that. We have so many questions. What were you doing on a little paddle boat at that age? Why were you fishing for piranha? Aren't they dangerous? Are they good? (laughs) Give us, give us this. Well, well, I was actually, let's see, I think I was 21 or 22 on that trip, but uh, yeah, I worked in a travel agency and this English couple owned it and they took me under their wing. um, And they're, you know, of course in travel, we all know that it is not necessarily the best paying job in the world, but their philosophy in life was in this business, you travel. So um, they were always so supportive. And that was actually part of my pay. And twice a year, they would send me to these unbelievably exotic locations. And of course, I liked the gritty stuff. So there was a trip that came up that was uh, for um, uh, South America and the Amazon. So there was a, um, I'll never forget it. Uh, It was called the SS Rio Amazonas or something. And it was literally a paddle boat that they had just put a motor on and it was like the the African queen tugging down the Amazon river. Um, and you could hear the drum beats at night from people. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was all, but, um, yeah, for fun, we would, uh, uh, we would put meat at the end of a hook and then we would go fishing for the piranha. Um, I actually went swimming too, which is something that now I'm just like, Oh, I can't believe I was in that water, but, um, but piranha are dangerous, but only when they are to the point of near starvation. So yes, they are capable of taking down a full cow, but you know, generally when, when they're in widespread water, you don't have to be as afraid. It's when the water is um, going away and they're in small ponds that they're kind of going crazy, but yeah, they do have the teeth and I did catch the biggest one. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) And no, we didn't eat it. It was a catch and release. I, that is so badass. 
I feel like we have a couple. Uh, we have a couple spinoff podcasts, Amy. We could do on on, on Steve's travels <laughs> and, and, and Pam's travels. I want to. I want to hear more about Pamela's travels. This is great. So forget. No, no, this is amazing. So Pamela, what else you got? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, maybe we can make it into a movie series. Could we <laughs> transition this? That's. I don't know. I think we've got something here. We're on to something here. <laughs> All right, so shall we uh, switch cameras over to uh, to talking travel? Um, we b- before we do that, we always kick off uh, every podcast with um, a bit of a lightning round, if that's okay with you all. Um, so it's three quick questions and three quick answers. Pamela, you want to go first? Sure. Cool. All right, favorite TV show that you're currently watching? In all sincerity. Uh, even though I'm not currently watching it because I'm waiting for the next season, I am a, and I'm again, not saying this just because of the audience, I am a huge Outlander fan. I have read the books and my mom passed away in 2015 and it was her years before that, that was just like, uh, I actually got her the first Outlander book. She read all eight I think three times at the time there were eight and I had, and Steve, I remember talking to him. He was kind enough to get my mom when they first cast Jamie, he got my mom a headshot of Sam Hewen and said to Sharon, you know, and, and if you could see the headshot of this gentleman that they call Jamie and then he turned into, he turned into Jamie. So huge outlander fan. Um, I I got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. Just, Add a little something to that. So Pam went to visit the set, but it took her a long time to get there. And so I had the character who plays Jamie record a little thing on my phone saying, Pam, we're waiting for you. When are you going to be here? Which I think you <laughs> oh. like that, right? Oh, <laughs> it is like a prized possession. <laughs> um, favorite shows that I am watching now, I think I kind of like the older stuff. I really, I will, I will rewatch Outlander over and over. Love that. Okay, cool. We got a lot of Outlander fans. Uh, on the show, including uh, my mother, who was telling me all about it. And, and a funny side story, like right before the call, I was talking to my mom and I'm like, what do you like about Outlander? She, she said, very cute cast. <laughs> <laughs> like, Thanks, mom. <laughs> okay, cool. So the second question, Pamela, is favorite all-time movie or show? All-time. Love Actually. With hands down. Love Actually. Mm-hmm. Good one. All right. And the third and final question is your favorite city to travel on a business trip? Uh, London, London or New York. Mm-hmm. You know, not to be boring, but I have friends there. I have colleagues there and it is just, I love discovering something new every time I go. And I am the queen of getting off the plane and just starting walking. Uh, I have worn out poor Gary Stevenson more than once. <laughs> that's good for him it's good for him <laughs> he loves it love those cities that's awesome all right steve you got a little preview so it's your turn so your favorite show that you're currently watching that would have to be the wheel of time so the wheel of time is based on a series of books that have sold like millions and millions of copies. Um, and um, <clears throat> I started working on this four years ago and I hired the producer of Outlander to produce it. Um, and what we did was we first needed a place to shoot it. So he nosed around and traveled around and we decided somewhere in Eastern Europe would be great. And we ended up in Prague and we found an abandoned truck factory that was Mm -hmm. over 300,000 square feet, which we converted into a film studio where we're shooting Wheel of Time. And Wheel of Time stars Rosamund Pike, if you remember her from Gone Girl, um, who's she's just fabulous. Um, And she's the star of the show. It's one of these fantasy different kind of world, big budget shows. Um, 
it is going to be on Amazon in uh, three weeks. And, you know, I'm answering, what's your favorite show? I'm actually like so in, in, engaged in the show. And so uh, and it, it is my favorite show to watch. Um, and I watch the, from the dailies that I'm watching every day because we're shooting season two, even though season one hasn't been on yet. And the, we're, I'm going to the premiere in London on the 15th of November, which is just two weeks from now which is great, which is going to be my first trip to Europe since the lockdown, which is oh, like, wonderful. I can't believe it. I'm a little nervous, actually. Um, um, for somebody who has 11 million miles to be nervous about traveling, <laughs> it's just, it's been so long um, since I've been to Europe. So anyway, I'm not really nervous, but, um, and, but what's great about, you know, Pamela's department, you know, who coordinates everything for me, you know, will walk me through, you know, okay, when you go through baggage, there's the, the COVID testing is right in the lobby at Heathrow and, and this, or when I was going to Puerto Rico um, for um, Fantasy Island, you know, there's a lot of hoops you got to go through these days. So it's really for me and for my team and, and the people we move around to have our travel department on the case, like helping us through it. Cause it, it really just trying to figure out, do you need to have the, do you need the QR code in Puerto Rico? Is the vaccine, is your thing on your phone enough? Or you need it? all those things that I can't figure out and, um, you know, get done. And then what do I need to check into the hotel? Like in Puerto Rico, you had to, you had to show your certificate to get into Puerto Rico. So anyway, all of that, it's really helpful having a team, a family's team behind my travel. My favorite movie, I would, you know, I'm just going to go back to a classic, which is the French connection with Gene Hackman, because he's such a good actor that I've just loved him over the years and all the stuff he's done from that to to playing Lex Luthor and Superman to the birdcage to you know all so anyway that would be my That's favorite I've never um, seen that. I gotta throw that on the list and yeah it, it won best picture I mean it, it's definitely a you know classic um, movie and the third question is your favorite city to travel to on a business trip That's a tough one um <clears throat> Definitely London, definitely New York, definitely Paris. Oh, um, I love Paris. Um, yeah. So Paris was, uh, and just if uh, I can go off your questions for a second, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things you were asking is, you know, things that a hotel does, you know, that, that cheeseburger thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was at the um, Park Hyatt in Paris and with, my wife and daughter and cousin Laura. And we got there before the room was ready. And they were like, you know, so you could hang out, um, you know, the, your room will be ready. So <clears throat> my daughter and her cousin are like wandering around. And apparently they were talking about how it was cousin Laura's birthday tomorrow. And so we go back and we're sitting in the lobby and Sting, by the way, is in the lobby. Oh. My, 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 my wife crazy. Um, but uh, um, so we're sitting there and all of a sudden a little cake comes out from the, the hotel employees are bringing out a cake and singing happy birthday to cousin Laura because one of them overheard cousin Laura talking to Emily, my daughter, about her birthday, which I thought, how, how, how nice is that? You know, that's just how beyond the call of duty for them to do that. So that's yeah. incredible. And, and yeah, thank you for sharing that. We, we love hearing stories like that. Our audience love hearing, hearing stories like that. It's, it's inspiring for, especially the hoteliers and, and, you know, some of the suppliers in the audience. So yeah, we, we certainly welcome uh, and, and uh, invite more of those types of stories. Um, you know, we, that was such a great story last episode too, about, you know, the cheeseburgers at 2 AM. And, and it's just like, these are the things that stick with you, right? It's like these little things, these like extra mile and you'll never forget that story. And how many people did you tell that story to? Right. And it's just like, it's the little things that count. It, the story goes with er anyone says to me, what's your favorite hotel in Paris? It's like, and here's why. Um, there you go. Love it. 
Yeah, it's so important. Well, let's let's keep going on that. I mean, thinking, speaking of all the cities we love and, you know, the hotels and the air and the ground, all the pieces that go to, you know, leisure travel, but really more importantly, the production travel. So should we talk travel? Let's do sure. it. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's dig in. And, you know, um, Amy and I at the top of the, um, of the podcast, we're, we're joking about all the world watching all the TV shows out there and um, that we're kind of just starving for new content. So I can imagine for the both of you, uh, when things started to open back up, you went from zero to 60 real fast. For Pam first, who um, working from behind the scenes from a travel management perspective, what's been the biggest adjustment you've had to make in getting back to work? You know, I have to say that not a lot shut down for us in a way, because, you know, there was that fateful day evening in March where we were told that the president would be shutting down the borders. And we had a lot of international productions going on, both TV and feature. And, you know, I have a, I tried to pretend that I can separate my personal life from my work life. So I have two phones. Um, it is pretend because as we know, there's, there is crossover, <laughs> but both of my phones started going and it was, you know, the heads of production, feature TV, executives, assistants saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So of course it was a, a stop, drop and roll and it was getting everybody back, um, which, you know, that took a week or so domestic and international, but then it was also preparing for what was going to be the next steps. Um, And as the unions were negotiating and as our executive management team was figuring it out, I know that a lot of people worked so closely with um, uh, health and safety. You know, all of a sudden, Sony ramped up and created their own testing facility on the lot in Culver City. Um, Our partners internationally were trying to figure out, you know, testing partners because testing obviously was key. Uh, a new term and a new phrase came up, which was our COVID captains, people that whose job it was created to be the COVID contact for people. Um, Sony Pictures is a working lot. So I believe it was, um, and don't quote me on this, but I think the Goldbergs, Wheel, and Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy were some of the first productions that, that started and kept going under these really intense guidelines. Um, While it was quieter, we did a lot of that cleanup internally, that stuff that you never have time to do. We really upped our technology internally. But on the production side, it was how quickly can we get these people out and what needs to happen? So it was such an incredible engagement with um, really our uh, international SOS team but a huge, huge hats off to our security and safety team because it was unbelievable opportunity for people to, we've always worked closely with them, but at that time it was, what do we need to do to make this happen? And we engaged regularly every Monday morning. We had a, 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 a meeting that travel was front and center of, of what are the areas doing? What is the opportunity for people? Uh, what is it going to take to get people back on planes? And it was constant. And, and frankly, it, it still is, because as we know, I'm starting to feel like as things are opening up, it's getting more challenging because not everybody is has the same rules. And while we're trying to educate our team and us being as up to date as possible so that we can share as much as possible, you know, our partners at the airlines and the hotels and different even in the government things are changing so quickly that not everybody is on the same page as quickly as the information comes out. So we are trying to make sure that our people have as much information as possible. Also too, besides safety and security, our government affairs team, we've got them in the US, we've got them in Europe. I don't know what we would do without those people because they are there with us and for us. And we're just constantly supporting each other in um, figuring out what it's going to take to get people out. Yeah. And Pamela, they probably say that same thing about you and your team. You know, I think, well, well, honestly, it's, you know, it's interesting how that travel. And like you said, and this kind of gets back to 
with working with suppliers and, you know, you're working in, in between and bringing that back to your safety and security and bringing that ba- back to your govern relations. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's an interesting point of, you know, the teams coming together and making those decisions and what you bring from the travel management side, right? You bring two pieces of it because you're also working pretty externally to help make sure this happens for your Sony teams and the productions and all of that. Yeah, and I think that's what makes uh, us as an in-house team exceptional as well, because we are all Sony employees. And so it is, um, we're really answering to a lot of people. And we're, you know, our responsibility is just to help this, you know, make this happen. I remember somebody told me a long time ago in the deepest, darkest depression, um, women bought lipstick and people went to the movies. And I always remember that. And the Sony Pictures is also our leadership is very into the on the on the feature side, very into the large screen experience. And so, while a lot a lot of companies are you know uh, really starting to concentrate their their content on you know home entertainment and um, uh, you know just direct to home entertainment release. We're very attached on the feature side to a big, big theatrical release. And um, it's, it's a huge commitment. And that is something that they're very proud of. And it's something that, um, you know, just makes it exciting for us to just kind of keep going. And I have told my team, and I, I've said this in, a, in, a, in front of another group, which is there's so much technology out there, but the greatest tool we have is ourselves. And our experience, because, you know, we've all been at this a long time. And I have been fortunate to have my job at Sony since, um, as you mentioned, 1990. We went through 9-11. We went through the volcano, uh, the hack. I mean, these are all truly traumatic experiences that it's like, okay, you know, first of all, are we okay? Physically, is everybody okay? Mentally, let's help support each other. And professionally, let's do it. What do we need to do to help make this happen? And I think it's a it's a proof of a of a personal value. You know, we're not curing cancer here. I recognize that, but there is yet something that we do that is so integral to our society and our community and our world because we do have a a chance of, of messaging. And Sony has. Um, uh, I'll try to find it, Steve. I don't know if you remember what it is, but it's um, it's how you uh, a- approach people emotionally, you know, on an emotional level, how Sony as a company from the entertainment piece to the technology piece um, to the, 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 the TVs and the music and all these things. So it's a it's a pretty extraordinary opportunity. And, and I consider myself really lucky to be a part of it. You know, one thing that you mentioned is all of that and how important that is you know, for people to have this content and what it provides and, you know, emotionally, but ultimately that couldn't happen if our directors, our producers, our actors weren't getting sleep because they came in late and the hotel is noisy and, you know, or the flight gets canceled, you know, so there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that I think doesn't always get the credit for, you know, how important it really is for the vitality of a production and a TV, a, you know, film, anything. So um, I'd love to hear on that side, Steve, you know, on the road warrior side, being out there and, you know, being the one that consumes this travel, what's your experience? Maybe something with the wheel of time. I don't know if you were in Prague and had to come back or if you stayed there. Cause I think filming started in November of 2019 or late 2019. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, I mean, I, I would, go there and I would go back and forth. Um, we, um, we were shut down. Um, you know, everything shut down in March, uh, until the summer we, we started to go back up. We had to wait for the unions to, um, we had an agreement called return to work. Um, so nothing was shooting for, for March. And, and I remember the year 2020 in January and February, I went to Charlotte and New York for focus group testing of the young and restless. I went to Glasgow, London and Prague 
and I went to the Galapagos Islands, all in the first two months. And then that was it. I didn't go anywhere. Um, and so the corporate, we, we weren't allowed to go to corporately. We were not, we were banned from travel. Um, so we had to run the shows remotely because we still, once we went back up, we still had to get actors in and out. And so it was a little of a challenge for me personally in that I couldn't go to the sets anymore. So I'm just dealing with Zooms and hearing how it's going and hoping for the best. And, and you know, like like that old United Airlines commercial, you know, we need to get out and see our clients. Well, <laughs> you need to get out and see your sets and see your actors. So that that was challenging. But, but you know, travel did a great job keeping things running because we still had to get, you know, and, and get actors. Primarily the actors were all from London for Wheel of Time. We had to get them to Prague. And that wasn't so simple because one day the borders were up and the next day they were down. Went, okay, uh, if you go through Amsterdam, you can drive through Germany. Uh-oh, they just closed the border at Germany. It was, it was really complicated. Um, so anyway, we, we, we got through all that and now we're allowed to travel again. Interesting. Well, I think it's, um, it's also a good transition into what we wanted to talk about next, kind of um, looking ahead. Uh, so, you know, we've talked about some of the adjustments that we needed to make, um, you know, during the, during the heart uh, of the lockdown and, and sort of the first, uh, sort of first phase of COVID what's, we're, we're curious to know what's happening like right now, what is like, what's, what's going on out there. We've heard about some trends with regard to ABC crews. Um, you know, are, are we still doing, uh, the, the COVID captains and we still have like, um, you know, the, the testing facility in the parking lot, like what, I guess, like what's going on out there in the production world right now. Um, all of the protocols that have been in place are still in place. So we test multiple times a week um, and we have different groupings in terms of either group A or group B. And that's a function of how close you're getting to the talent. Um, we have, COVID captains on every set and, you know, six foot mandatory spacing. The set is one of the safest places to be um, uh, because there's such stringent protocols. And um, on all the shows I've been involved with, we've not really ever had a shut full shutdown. We've been able to work around if there's been an issue. Um, we've worked around it. Um, but if you look at the number of tests we do and the number of positives, it's a tiny fraction. Um, it's really, really, really low. So, you know, keeping our cast and crew safe is absolutely of paramount importance to us. Um, and it, it's worked. Um, so we are able to keep the pipeline going and, um, and going back to the movie theater you know, it's absolutely really important to us corporately. And I went and saw James Bond the other day in the movie theater. And it was great. Um, so go see Venom, another fun yeah. Sony film. And what what's coming up next, Pamela? Um, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, yes. Yay. So I got to say, I saw the first movie uh, in the theater that I that I saw since the the lockdown was Venom in the theater and then the I pick in Westwood, and it was awesome. So yeah, thank you. That was like cool. it, it was such a cool experience to get back out there. But so uh, in our last podcast, Stephen, to to hit on your point about the set being the safest uh, place to be, that's very interesting because in our last podcast, in talking to Tom Hamilton. Um, he was mentioning that the airplane, the team airplane was the safest place to be. Right. And everybody uh, is worried about travel and getting on an airplane. He's like, I, I have never felt safer in an airplane. So I thought that that was a really good point. And some of the uh, like unexpected places uh, tend to be, tend to be the safest and uh, can, can really appreciate what you guys are doing. And if I'm not mistaken, what? some of the, the, the regulations and the rules that were set forth by production locations, the, the COVID regulations really actually helped other people and other companies uh, create the steps of what will happen, you know, to enter their offices, to enter their different locations, restaurants. So uh, it, it was, uh, it, it shows 
the intensity and the hunger, I think that the industry, how seriously they took it and how everybody came together as a, as an industry to make sure that um, people were, were ready, keep it as safe as possible and, and let's keep it going. And I think it was a huge part of the economy, which is why some countries created the uh, national interest exceptions where some countries would not let certain actors go, you know, or, you know, where normal travelers couldn't go from A to B, uh, national interest exceptions were created for, my understanding is for um, entertainment uh, that included sports because people recognize uh, not only how important it was to keep the process going, but how much money is brought into the local economies by production. And so, uh, you know, still it was super intense and you had to go through a lot of hoops and, and, uh, thank you again to our federal and government affairs people for for uh, making that happen for a lot of our people. But it it kept the ball rolling. Yeah, I think that is so important. And even how you know these regulations and you know the COVID captains and the ABC crews and all of this, how it relates even back to travel, right? Right? Like, because you have to, if someone has to be quarantined, I've heard stories of directors, some that I know that are stuck in a hotel for 14 days, you know, in the past, of course, hopefully we're kind of beyond that. But Pamela, I bet you can speak to this and probably maybe even Steve on a personal level is, you know, for suppliers kind of giving them an insight into the background work and maybe what they can do, pieces of advice or, you know, one thing that would make a difference, whether you're on a flight or in a hotel or in a car, something that, you know, really would make a difference or a great experience that you had just in the last 18 months that suppliers should continue to do, even when COVID is a distant memory. Sure. Uh, and I look forward to that moment, by the way. Um, <laughs> I think with any huge change, there are things about this that will shift in our industry where something is going to keep going. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if while well, masks won't be mandated, I think going forward, we're going to see a lot of people wearing masks um, as our friends in the Asia Pacific have done for years. Um, so I think there are things that will, that will continue to be, um, you know, I was thinking about this question and I think the most important thing that we can do, you know, buyers, suppliers and whatnot, you know, be open, be honest, be creative, ask questions and really, really listen. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that it is so difficult for people because, you know, there's a staffing shortage and we all have stories of our friends and colleagues that work in hotels, general managers that were downstairs doing laundry as well as delivering you know, to go food that has been brought in, you know, and my hats off to my, my friends and colleagues in other areas of travel, because the amount of creative and cross training that everybody has had to do has been really, you know, exceptional. Um, and I think that recognizing, I know one thing that's really important is that Knowing that the production has very strict guidelines, uh, make sure that that message stays uh, because we know that if we have some states that don't have the same, let's say, mask mandates or whatnot as we do here in California or the intensity level, um, make sure that when you book a production at a hotel, that that hotel follows all of the guidelines that are required. Uh, you know, I've heard a few war stories of people showing up in hotels in different parts, different states that are much looser. And people were walking around the hotel, no masks. They weren't really following the guidelines that were even protocol of the brand. And that's a showstopper. It's devastating. It makes everybody that created that contract, you know, basically a fool in one way. Uh, but we have to have these protocols, we have to have the, um, you know, when it comes to food, when it comes to different, as Steve said, you know, still six feet and, and whatnot. And without those, we can't keep doing what we're doing. So I know it's a challenge. I think it's going to continue for a while. Um, you know, and I know like I was at a conference where we've heard these where the bracelets, there's green, yellow, and red green is like, I'm in, come and hug me. Orange or yellow is like, okay, I just need my space. And red is, 
I must have six feet. I think we need to take that stuff really seriously. Uh, it's not over yet. It will be, I know it will be, but I think that as uncomfortable as it is for some of us, uh, we need to really follow those protocols and respect what is being asked of us as an industry. And, and, and I think that on a sort of a different level, it, a lot of people in the entertainment industry really need their hands held as much as <laughs> And, and I, I think it's a it's not barking dog here. Um, I think that um, what it would be really helpful is if a property, when one of our clients shows up at, at checking into the hotel, could just clearly say what is and is not available. If it's on a piece of paper or whatever. Hey, listen, um, we're only going to do turn down service on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, the room service only has a ham sandwich, but here's a list of places that deliver. Just those simple things that when you're, when, especially if you're an actor and you're checking in to the Prague Hilton, you know, and you don't know anything about Prague and there's no room service and there's no nothing, what do you do to survive? So just a, a helpful cheat sheet from the hotel would be great. That's what I would recommend. That's excellent. Just some transparency and integrity um, goes a long way. Love yeah, that. it's fine. Everybody gets, you know, there's not going to be turned down service uh, all the time. So don't expect it. Just we're not going to do it. Um, so then you're not waiting for the, the, somebody to knock on the door. Love yeah, that. I think managing expectations, right? right. Like knowing it, it does make it so much easier for travelers. And especially as Pamela said, it's so different everywhere, you know, it's, and so as a traveler and especially a road warrior, that's going to location, to location, to location, you don't have time to be like, Oh, what's this hotel doing? What's this hotel doing? So if they can give you something, it makes your experience so much easier. That's, that's great advice. That's really good advice. One thing I think, Pamela, that you brought up when we were doing our pre-production was silver linings and the human element and everything and how yeah. important it is. I'd love to get both of your opinions on that because I think, you know, I mean, it's your industry too, right? But you have to bring people together. You don't have a choice. Your actors, I, I know they did some silly Saturday Night live skits and stuff of like actors having sheets in front of them and, you know, things like that, but that's not reality. So getting, you know, and it's already happening, it has happened, but just doing it safely. And what is the silver lining in all of this? And why is that human element so important in bringing travel back? Yeah, I, I think that um, we're watching the silver lining in a lot of ways is that travel is coming back. And I personally feel like any, Anything like this that challenges us does bring us closer together. Um, and being able to collaborate, being able to also recognize internally and with each other, the, you know, those good days and bad days and where we can help pick each other up and how it has opened eyes. I know it's, you know, it, it's something that people talk about a lot, but, you know, we've all been invited into each other's homes in this weird sort of way. And, you know, when the dog is barking because the Amazon delivery guy is here or uh, the kid jumps on your lap or I was babysitting well, with you guys, I had my yeah. daughters here and their mom was just like, stay out of Pammy's office. You know, she needs, she has a call, but I have these little faces coming around the corner and they're curious and, you know, I think it is, it's such a beautiful opportunity to really be human. And on the other way, we're all super challenged with uh, different feelings, different opinions, different thoughts about how things are working, but essentially it's the opportunity for us to come together and really to support each other. Uh, travel is all about people. And as I may have mentioned before, the technology is extraordinary. The technology that has come out of this, uh, the different tools, whether it be uh, Sherpa or, you know, I know there's a bunch of tools out there uh, that just made our lives so much easier, but it was the humans and the need behind it and the integrity of information that we needed that drove it. 
And so I think we, we cannot underestimate the importance of uh, what we know, what we bring to the table, um, our humanness in this whole thing, and, uh, and hopefully just taking better, better care of each other as we have this passion. I feel like I'm working in entertainment, working in travel, in entertainment, brings so much of the of similar wants, needs, and desires together. And uh, and thinking quick on your feet has never been more, more important. And but be creative and be human. I love it. I love it. Stephen, do you want to take it from your side? Of- yeah, yeah. Well so I was I was gonna say, you know, the silver lining is that um, we we've we've made it through this and it's not completely in the rear view mirror. But we all pulled together and, and making films and TV shows requires a diverse group of people to all be on the same page and go, working towards the same goal. And what I found is that a lot of the nonsense has been cast aside. It's sort of like we, we made it through and we all got together and and we all have the same what the goal is, is to try to make the best show we can is so much more obvious and apparent to everybody and the things that people would fight about and complain about just don't exist anymore it's like there's just no time for it it's it's just we're dealing with this pandemic and getting through it and keeping the machinery going and the only way we did it was by throwing aside all the little petty grievances and, and everything else. So I, I found, and I, I think panel you, you'd agree, just everybody's much more focused on what the real task is and working together as a, as a group um, to come to consensus and co- correct conclusions about how to move forward. And to, to our to our, our colleagues and friends in the um, in the service side of the industry, thank you, thank you for those who've been able to survive it and stick through it. Um, I know there are still still challenges, as we mentioned about um, uh, limited uh, staffing, and and as Steve mentioned, just the importance of being upfront about what you can offer. Really, really managing expectations because I think if you if you are honest, if you are straightforward with someone. They know what to expect, um, and I think some people recognize, and, and and those that don't recognize, we're we're working on them on a daily basis. That things are very, very, very different. Thank you both. This has been fantastic. Um, we appreciate you both taking the time to be on the show. Wish you all the luck with the, you know, new shows coming up and the travel and production that goes along with it. That's wonderful. Thank you guys. And thank you for all the advice today. Thanks for all the stories. This was super helpful, super helpful for our audience. And um, as we're all kind of uh, going toward the same goal here and getting back on the road and and getting it face to face, whether it's production, whether it's sports, whether it's just everyday business travel, I think we all have the same goal. We want to, we want to get back out there and to hear these stories and to be able to spend the last hour with you was, um, was super impactful. And we really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for tuning in for this episode of It's Me Again. This podcast was brought to you by the Global Business Travel Association. We appreciate you listening and for sticking with us all the way to the end. And if you want to find out more information about GBTA membership and awesome podcasts like this one, you can find those at GBTA.org. Tune in next time for more exclusive content, special guests, and inside info into the wide worlds of sports, media, and entertainment. And cut. That's a wrap.